All right, the Reds, it is the final word from the Anfield app. And of course, the final word is normally the final word about the match that Liverpool have just played. We are going to talk a little bit about Fulham v Liverpool, but there isn't loads to talk about, if we're all being honest, because, well, Liverpool were crap. Uh, but also, I'm sure you all know by now that Gerard Julier has sadly passed away. Uh, so we are going to have a bit of a chat about Jed, uh, about what he meant to us, about what he did for our football club. Uh, so we will do a little bit of Fulham. We'll touch briefly on the fact that we've got Tottenham on Wednesday, but the majority of the show will be dedicated to Jed and his genius. Uh, I've got Ian Salmon with me today to talk about all of that uh, on the final word. And yeah, just starting with Fulham then, Ian, as I say, I don't, I don't feel like there's a load to talk about. We've got sort of accepted facts yeah. on this. And accepted fact number one is Liverpool didn't play very well. No. Particularly in that first half hour. That first half hour was Aston Villa levels of bad. If we didn't have Alisson in goal, we would have been 3 0 down by half time. No question of the fact at all. Um, it's a massively, massively missed opportunity. Mm. Spurs have dropped points. City have dropped points. United have dropped points. We got a chance to actually go top of the league clear from Spurs. We could have been two points ahead of them going into Wednesday night with a chance of being five points ahead of them on Thursday morning. And we missed it. And, you know, all credit's full. And Fulham started brilliantly. Yeah. They, they came out of the blocks and they, they were attacking us like it was the last game that they were ever going to play. It really, really mattered to them. And we just didn't deal with them. And we made Adam Ola. Adam Ola Luckman is a good footballer. Yeah. I thought he should have done well at Everton and it just didn't work for him. But we made Adam Ola Luckman look like a world beater. And we just gave him the space to play. Now, some of that could be the gap between Fabinho and Trent. And a lot of that, I think, is, for me, it, and I'm not going to question Klopp on this because he's got the sports science, he knows what he's doing, he's got the details of why he's playing players. Um, I'm not going to question why Jota was played on um, Wednesday night and is now out for six weeks. I, I'm not going to question that because the choices he's made are informed choices. It doesn't always mean that they're the right choice and yeah. you know it can turn out there wasn't the right thing to do, but I don't know why Trent was playing at the weekend because Trent did 99 minutes after injury. I thought the weekend game, playing you know, playing against, um, I forgot who we were playing, I was playing against Fulham. Um, I thought Nico Williams would have been good for the 90 minutes. I thought that would have been sensible. Save Trent for spares. He's got too many minutes in his legs. And I think we got found out. Bit, possibly we were a little bit complacent going into it. I think this is a game that we will win. Uh, possibly it's some of the fact that we are nursing ourselves through games and trying not to expend too much energy all the time, but we were found out on every single level in that first half hour. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Fulham played, played much above expectations and Liverpool played much below expectations. There were, of course, you know, a few moments in there, a few little bright points, if you like. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I, would, I would be sat here naked if uh, Curtis had managed to finish off that run, which was, you know, Maradona stroke McManaman-esque. I, I, I think it would have been justified <laughs> if he had. If that if he'd have put that in the back of the net, that would have been a career-defining goal. Yeah. That's the kind of thing that announces you to the world. That's, that's without one to submit to hyperbole, that's Owen against Argentina. It's that kind of run. There's McManaman-esque. McManaman against Celtic, if I yeah, remember Celtic, right. Celtic, one against Villa as well, very similar. From the right back position and just taking the entire length of the pitch. And obviously, Curtis wasn't carrying it that far. He just did it from midway inside his own half. It's good, though. It's an incredible run. It's a it flash, deserved the goal. Can be. Yeah. And, and Curtis has been an absolute bonus these last few weeks because he's shown the player he is. I think when he first came through, he looked like he was a fairly steady player. Then you saw him add a bit of genius to it. And it was kind of like, is a genius at the expense of all these incredible things he can do in the middle. Is it the expense of discipline? I know he's turned into a fully rounded midfielder who deserves to be the first name on the team sheet at the age of 19. And that that is just ridiculous. He's, he's an exceptional footballer and he's doing stuff for this club that is going to set him up for the next 15 years of his career. I think uh, I was reading Paul Ghost in the Echo here and he was saying uh, about, you know, that there are some... There are little things there to be concerned about as well. You know, here we are at the top of the league and all that. I get, I get the quotes yeah. and I get that we've got a big chance against Spurs. But equally, you know, I was one of those that was saying, oh, I'm not having this, you know, that there's a bit of a problem away from home because loads of people were bolting on those games when we'd already won the league and, and it didn't yeah. really matter. But our, our, our away record this season now doesn't look that great. And OK, we're denied at Brighton. We're denied yeah. at Everton. Well, it's, it's VAR at Brighton. It's VAR against Everton. Yeah. At, at the other home, the other away is City. Yeah. You know, how many away games have we played this season? Well, there's three that you can put the exceptions into straight away because we were 
excellent against Everton. Uh, although that's obviously where all our injuries come from. We, we haven't gotten those when we'll see Thiago. We beat Chelsea. We beat Chelsea. We, we've played well enough away. There have been a couple of outliers. Villa is still a massive outlier. Yeah. And yes, he's an outlier. And most seasons, if it wasn't for the application of VAR, and you know, the, the VAR... Um, the VAR yesterday. When did we play Saturday or yesterday? Sat yesterday. Um, <laughs> I don't even know what day. This is what lockdowns this, done. This is what me. happens in pandemics. So the, everyone the, goes out the window. This is the first time I've been out of the house since March. Um, <laughs> first time anyone's let me out of the house since March. The VAR yesterday, the fact that we can spend three minutes analysing whether one of the cleanest tackles you've joke. ever seen in your life is a penalty. But we don't analyse the push in the back on Salah. The VAR is, it's inconclusive, it's, it's spending too long nitpicking on ridiculous things and looking for issues that aren't necessarily there. If VAR wasn't as fussy as it is, if it was applied the way it had been applied in the Champions League up until Wednesday night, then the goal against Everton would have been a goal. The goal against Brighton would have been a goal. Those two things would have and gone all of a sudden, Europe. And all of a sudden, we're four points clear in yeah. the top. No one's talking about our away record because our away record is superlative. It's not even like you can see a trend because we're looking at this more than our results going, well, well, what's the trend? Are we not scoring goals? Well, we put four against Wolves, and obviously at home. But one question to ask would be, do Fulham perform so well yesterday because, of the because of their fans? Because it's, it's only the home fans there. Yeah, the, the away chance. team isn't hearing any voices, but the home team have got that. And because they're ahead, and they've got the fans behind them. And the fans were excellent for them, yes. Yeah, too. absolutely, absolutely. Well, and they did play well. It, and they did do very well. have got to say that. Look, on, on the sort of looking for things that aren't there, um, there's a little bit of, you know, and, and, and Gorsley mentions it in, in the Echo today about Sadio Mane. Eight games, an eight game run now without a goal is longest in his Reds career to yeah. date. At the same time, as well, you've got Firmino, who's only scored two this season. Meanwhile, you know, Salah's got 13. Yeah, and so you know, so it's all fine until it isn't fine. If you know what I mean. So yeah. all of a sudden now, you know, Jota's out as you mentioned. Well, yes, he's a different game if we can bring Jota on sixty minutes. Exactly, but then also as well, you're looking at Sadio Mane when he's got that chance, and you're like, well, you, you probably should have took that Sadio. Yeah. You're looking for a bit more from Bobby. All this said, can you see us against Spurs bouncing back and being the Reds we know and love? Yeah, completely. Because we will have fans in the ground. The fans who are in the ground it will only be two thousand, but they'll yeah. be bang up for it. We know that, oh well, we don't know, but I'd be amazed if Mourinho's doing anything other than coming for a draw. He'll do his usual. Yeah. If we can get the first goal, we can take control of the game, and we've got the players to get the first goal. I'd, again, I'd be a lot happier if we had Jota. I'd be a lot happier if there were more options in the midfield. Um, but I would put Curtis Jones up against Spurs midfield any day of the week. Um, I would hope Matip's going to be fit. Uh, I know he's getting treatment. I know it was a back spasm. Mm. Um, I hope Trent is is okay to play. If we can get Matip, um, Fabinho, Trent, Robbo out there, and Alisson's in goal, then I think we're going to be pretty okay at the back. But you need to start we, we need the first goal. We need, to, yeah. we need to start brightly. We need the first goal. Because if we get the first goal, Mourinho's game plan of sit deep and try and break and hope you get one through, through Son and Kane is out the window immediately and he'll actually have to open up and try and play some football. And he doesn't like doing that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, on to Gerard Houllier then. I mean, as you all know, uh, he managed the Reds from 1998 till 2004. Uh, won us five trophies, including the FA Cup, the League Cup, and the UEFA Cup treble in 2000, 2001. I'll say it again, one of the greatest times to be a Red, one of the greatest times to be a fan of Liverpool Football Club and be going to those games. It was fantastic. Uh, his last managerial job was at Aston Villa. He left in 2001 after nine months following some heart problems. Uh, he did, of course, have the heart surgery at Liverpool um, after the game or during the game against Leeds, uh, returning to the dugout um, and the, the famous night against Roma, of course, and everything else. It uh, remained another three years before leaving in 2004. Um, he also led Lyon to two French titles before joining the French Football Federation. Um, and, you know, he came to Liverpool, didn't he, and with a big reputation. You know, yeah. he'd, he'd been involved in you know, France's international team. And it was a bit of a... I, I don't think people realise how big a move it was. I mean, there's the 
there's the joint manager thing, which in itself was a bit mad. And I think yeah. we all know now when we look back at that, 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 that was a mistake. But as, as it's been reported this morning, apparently that was one of Julier's conditions. Really? That if he was coming to Liverpool, Roy Evans stays in place. Yeah. And it's, you know, I think that shows some of the, the measure of the man yeah. as a human being straight away. But, but it, it was it was a, it was a departure, wasn't it? From yeah, you know completely. a long-standing Liverpool way of you know you promote from within or you promote from you know the Liverpool way and all that, and it was a big departure to go for then a foreign manager. Yeah. And so that immediately places a lot of pressure on his shoulders, and I just think you know it's massive that he comes in to a dressing room, to a club, to a set of supporters. You know, you can go on forever to a Premier to. Everyone looking in and going, well, what's this fella gonna gonna do here? Yeah. And he challenged the culture, challenged senior players, you know, revolutionised Melwood. Like all of that is not easy to do. No, you've got to think. Well, as a fan base, as a club, we weren't used to the idea of an outsider coming in to manage mm. the club because the last outsider to come in was Shankly. Yeah. And from that point on, everybody had been in Liverpool. Sooness may have been other places and then come back, but everybody had been an appointment who had a history with Liverpool. And obviously, Gerard's history with Liverpool was he taught at Allsop and he'd stood on the cop, which was a fantastic thing. And he he genuinely there was a genuine love for the club because yeah, of that. Absolutely. And the, him coming in, it's within that first season. You look at the testament that's come out this morning, uh, specifically from the likes of Danny Murphy and Michael Owen, and very much from Jamie Carragher. They absolutely adore him. Yeah. As as a man, as a manager, and as a man, they absolutely adore him. Um, both Danny Murphy and Jamie Carragher have said that they made him better people. They, he made he made them better people, yeah. which is a fantastic testament to him. But he does revolutionise it. He's very within his first full season. One of the first things he does is he changes that that dressing room culture that possibly was embodied by Paul Ince, being the, the self styled governor of the of the dressing room. Um, he makes it the team more important than any individual. He moves in on very quickly. He's the captain of the club, and that, that's a that's a massive call mm. to make. I think um, he loses McManaman very early, but I think he'd have probably kept McManaman if it had been anything to do with his choice. But he builds a team, and it, one of the um, articles I was reading this morning, Session of the Crown in the Guardian, um, was talking about the fact that his buying, his initial buying was fantastic. Players that you wouldn't have expected to come in to play for Liverpool. Um, Hoopier and Honshaw. You know, Hoopier is a complete unknown mm. from Finland. Honshaw is a lad who's played for Blackburn. Haman has played for Newcastle, but it's not a name you would have expected to come and be the backbone. But his eye for a player was absolutely impeccable. And the next season he brings in Marcus Babel. Yeah. And that, I remember that, being so excited about that, that as well, because that was like, you know, again, there will be people watching who are maybe too young or whatever to remember it all, but. Babel was like top tier. Yeah. And like it was like, wow, Marcus Babel's coming to Liverpool. Find, find that literally, find out Marcus Babel was coming to play for us. Yeah. It was like great. find out Tiago was coming. Yeah, it was it's, fantastic. it's that level of brilliance. It, it's an established German international who is an incredible footballer. And Julia could bring in that type of footballer. Littman as well. I mean, it might not have worked. Yeah, it, it, it didn't we work, but we were know, extremely oh. excited to have a name like that come to Liverpool. I mean, this is the thing, isn't it? I think, you know, we, we all. We all always will, and we all always did get romantic about our football club, yeah. about the name and everything else. But for so many of us, for for me, you know, this was the era where I saw my football club win trophies, and I was at the game. It yeah. wasn't just in a book. It wasn't just a DVD. It wasn't a film. It wasn't a story from a, you know, a, a mate or whatever. I was there. I went to Dortmund. I went to Cardiff. I was at those cup finals, and this was sort of, you know, my, me experiencing. All those things I'd heard about for myself, and that was that. You know, that was down to Julie. That was down to, you know, the spirit, the will, the discipline that he put into the club, the players he signed, as you yeah. said as well. But he got Liverpool at the time punching above their weight. I mean, I seen Carragher saying before, you know, there were very good Arsenal sides at this time, very good Man United yeah. sides at this time, and to beat both of those sides in cup finals. Was no mean feat. No, and and with Arsenal, obviously they played us off the park for eighty-nine yeah. minutes. Then Mike Lowen popped up with two goals. That made it all the better, though. Yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> but it was the resiliency put into it. It was it was more about the organisation, the determiners, determination, and the resilience that he could put into a yeah. squad. He he taught them how to be a team rather than a collection of players. And you know the team, the team prior to Gerard coming, we played some fantastic football. There was some some lovely stuff going on during the nineties. It just didn't quite get to that. 
it, it, it would have been Champions League every season if the Champions League was set up as it is now um, because we were top four every season. But when he came in, he gave us that other thing. And as you said, we knew who he was when he came in. It was a massive capture. Yeah. There's been a respect from all across the world for, for Gerard this morning. and it, It's been all over social media and it's been... Been lovely to see. I mean, uh, Ian mentioned uh, Danny Murphy's interview and Jamie Carragher's as well. Uh, they're both worth watching, and you can see how much it meant to those two. Um, but you know, the club, the club itself, obviously put something out there. We are mourning the passing of our treble winning manager Gerard Houllier. The thoughts of everyone at Liverpool Football Club are with Gerard's family. Uh, there was a nice one from uh, Chris Kirkland as well. He said, "You made my LFC dream come true." A truly warm, special human being. I'll never forget what you did for me and so many others. Rest in peace. Thoughts are with your family at this heartbreaking time. Uh, Chris also spoke uh, well on Radio 5 this morning. and He was saying, I've always been a Liverpool fan. And my first game was when I was seven in 1988. And he said, and then he made my dreams come true by signing me. He was a special man. And it wasn't just about football. It was about being a human being too. His door was always open. He had this warm feeling about him, which when you were talking to him made you feel like a million dollars. He will be really sadly missed. He changed the dynamics at Liverpool. He changed it all and the way they went forward. His team talks were special, especially when you needed to get a result in Champions League nights and huge Premier League games. He had you on the edge of your seat, listening to every word. He was so calm. He went on, he said more, and it was all absolutely brilliant. And there's so many players, you know, Stephen Gerrard there on his Instagram, devastated to hear the news. My former manager, Gerrard Hulier, has passed away. I will never forget what this man did for me and my career. Rest in peace, boss. Carragher, as mentioned, absolutely devastated by the news about Hulier. I was in touch with him only last month to arrange him coming to Liverpool. Loved that man to bits. He changed me as a person and as, as a player, as you mentioned, Ian. And he got Liverpool back winning trophies. RIP, boss. Roy Evans as well, uh, a man who you know you may think may not have the best feelings about Gerard Houllier because of course, as we mentioned before, comes in joint managers. It's eventually Roy that has to leave. But you know he's tweeted out there incredibly sad news here of the passing of Gerard Houllier, a gentleman I have the greatest respect for and what he achieved at Liverpool Football Club. Condolences to his family. I spoke to Evo myself before about Gerard as well, and he said you know at the time, yeah, I was a bit pissed off. He said, but I met him in you know life after that and they ended up getting on absolutely fine which is always lovely to hear uh, loads of others there michael owen heartbroken to hear that my old boss has sadly passed away phil thompson uh, they, them two had a great relationship of course absolutely devastated and heartbroken at the sad news of the passing of gerard my mate my colleague my boss one of the greatest moments of my life was when we come together in 1998 just to be in his company was an absolute treat so loyal so passionate and extremely fierce. Uh, Everton have put something out as well. Excellent touch, really good. Uh, I'm the first one to be a knobhead about Everton, as you know, but fair play to them there. Ian Rush, Gary Lineker, it goes on. Ashley Young, thank you for improving me. Condolences to your family. Great man, not just manager. Paris Saint-Germain put something out there as well. Manchester United, Robbie Fowler. Alex Ferguson. Alex Ferguson Alex as well. Ferguson has said that they became friends while Gerard was at Anfield. And they stayed friends ever since, which is a lovely thing. There's also a, a fantastic piece, um, a Jeff Shreve's interview with Gerard that he showed on Sky earlier, um, where Jeff Shreve's asked him, you know, what is the most important thing you've learned through the game? And he said generosity. Generosity of your ability and your spirit and giving to other people because that's where you get your rewards. Yeah, I've that's seen fantastic. that. It's fantastic. I like I liked Gary in his tweet as well. He just said, oh no, Gerard Hulier has passed away. One of football's smartest, warmest and loveliest people. That was my reaction, I've got to be honest with you. I was just like, oh no, Gerard. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was sort of, you know, it, it, it did touch it because, you know, we've mentioned, we talked a lot about football. We talked a lot about what he did with, with players and, and how he changed them as, as players and as people. But also, you know, and I, and I know this is a bit of a cliche, but it's right. He, he got Liverpool, didn't he? Completely, he, he, yeah. He got, he got the fan base, and that's why that's why there's so many flags and banners and songs yeah. and stuff like that. He lifted us all up. You know, he, he got us behind him. And we had a fantastic time supporting yeah. Julio's Liverpool. No, he, he, he is genuinely and always will remain one of the absolute greats. And I, I was, I, I got, I basically got in from a, a 5K this morning to the 5K, came in, Soaking wet because I decided to run at the wettest time of the day. 
Um, I've got my earphones in, Jeanette's sitting on the couch, and I'm like, I'm about to be told off for dripping all over the place, take the earphone out, and she's like, Gerald Houllier's died. And my wife's never told you, and she was like, it, she, she, she was like, it's such sad news, because he, he just seemed like such a good man. Yeah. I think that I think that's the key thing that comes out. I mean, you know, I've got Evertonian friends as well, and we, like everyone else, got WhatsApp groups and stuff like yeah. that. And you know, I just just before I started the show here, I just seen a message pop up in our group from from one of the Evertonian lads, and he just said that's a real shame. He seems such a yeah. nice man, and I think that is the the overriding feeling about Gerard Julia. He was fantastic for Liverpool. He was fantastic for football. Um, it's it's brilliant to see all the tributes for him. Uh, all we can say really is Gerard. Thank you. That has been the final word.